This episode, I'm joined by William C. Hackett, a philosopher, novelist, and translator. In this episode, we discuss the work of Jean Val, primarily from the text Human Existence and Transcendence, alongside discussions on phenomenology, Heidegger, God, faith, and more. I'd like to say a big thank you to my paid patrons and subscribers for making all of this work possible. And if you'd like to support Medics, gain access to some exclusive content, or just keep everything running as everything relies on donations alone, then please find links in the description below. Otherwise, please enjoy. So, Chris Hackett, thanks very much for joining us on Medics podcast. And my pleasure. Uh, we are going to be discussing the work of Jean Val. Um, primarily from taking, well, I was primarily taking inspiration and influence from uh, your translation of human existence, well, the tran translated name is Human Existence and Transcendence, which is part of the Thresholds in Philosophy and Theology series by University of Notre Dame Press. And this was, the translation was published in uh, 2016, I believe. So this uh, originally, you know, the original book by Jean Val himself is based off a 1937 lecture, which was extremely important as you say, and we'll get to that. And then it was revised and sort of expanded upon in 1946. Correct. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So, this, mm -hmm. so I'm cool. sort of using this as a means to jump into the work of Jean Val generally. Um, but before we do so, just, um, yeah, Chris, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, how, where your interest in Val came from and uh, how this translation came about. Oh, very good. I, my interest in Val came from, I was a doctoral student and, and look, you know, one of those, I had a doctor, um, doctoral supervisor who gave me three ideas. He gave me three ideas. He, he um, told me to think through my dissertation idea, obviously, and in which I ended up writing it. But, but he also told me you, what you need to do, what you should do is uh, go to France and do a book of interviews with French philosophers, which I ended up doing uh, called Quiet Powers of the Possible. It's a really, really fun, fun project to work on. Um, I, and and he said this, another great thing you could do is translate this little book, Existence, Humanity, and, Tran and Transcendence, uh, by Jean Val. And uh, I kind of kept that in my back pocket, uh, moved to France and lived in Paris for several years. Well, not for several years, excuse me, for as I was completing my dissertation and um, uh, did the book of interviews and um, didn't get around to writing, to translating this book by Jean Val for a couple of years and um, it, it required going to his archives in, in Normandy and um, doing quite a bit of research there um, on his work. But when I did, I uh, got really excited because I, I discovered this story, this uh, a year in his life of his, his trial under the uh, German occupation and so on. And that's sort of a companion in my mind, a companion to this translation really is the, the fiction project that I've, that I've begun with outside the gates. But, but as far as this book goes, uh, it, it really was uh, a nudge from my doctoral supervisor. And it was really a fantastic idea because it introduces or reintroduces really Jean Vol to the uh, English speaking world um, in a unique way. I think it's a really important text, as you pointed out in its day. And it really captures a moment, an, a critical moment in 20th century French and European philosophy as a whole. Mm. Um, so there you have it. So were you, did you know of Val beforehand or was this, this like jumping into the deep end? No, I, I did. You know, he, he is someone who, when you think of French philosophy in the 20th century, his name is not first, um, to, at least to contemporaries. You have Emmanuel Levinas or you have uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre or, or Camus or somebody like that. But Val was right there in the middle of them. Uh, he was Levinas's close friend and associate. Levinas claims that he owes everything to Vol. Some of the fundamental insights in his own work derive from what Vol was talking about right here in this in this book, Human Existence and Transcendence. So uh, that's one of the uh, that that notes something very important about the book for contemporary modern contemporary French philosophy. He um, was at the center of Parisian intellectual life, um, academic life, not only as a philosopher but also as a poet. And uh, that's before and after the war, before and after his exile to America. He, he sort of was at the center of things, influenced generations of students, including um, Deleuze. Jacques Derrida was his research assistant. Um, there's a whole lot more to say about his, his influence on persons. He really was at the center of, of things for many decades. 
there in Paris. So he's, he's someone who is uh, sort of being rediscovered, not only in France, but also in, in outside of France. In, new editions of his works are coming out in French. Uh, things are being translated, including what I did, but also um, other things, too, are, are appearing, which is really uh, exciting because uh, he does have a contribution to make that's mm-hmm. mm-hmm. um, still live, I think. Mm. There's a few of these uh, peculiar figures who are uh, often they've influenced seemingly everyone under the sun in terms of a you know a certain event in philosophy in, in philosophy in the history of philosophy and yet they themselves are often you know we say well we have to understand this person's work to understand Deleuze or whoever it might be or Levinas but then we never really venture back to actually them themselves and see what's going on there it's always interesting to see who who makes the grade in terms of the canon often, yeah and it's often and for, t- uh, no discernible reason as well yeah who's left out right and and history's open you know so so people get kierkegaard for example is a great example or, or this happens to artists all the time they're unknown in their lifetime and then they're discovered uh, this happened to kierkegaard he, he's discovered and becomes a really central centerpiece mm-hmm. of the 20 and 20th century uh really 19th late ni- mid 19th late 19th and 20th century intellectual culture not only in in europe but also in, in russia too uh-huh. Um, but he, he and, and today, if you're an undergraduate finishing your degree and you haven't read and been and been transformed by Kierkegaard, you know, there's there's something that we have to talk about. I mean, he's really a, an important person to read. And there's, of course, there's always the uh, reverse instance, which probably interests me more of people who in their day were on par with being a celebrity. And yeah. now <laughs> we couldn't care less. I mean, exactly. We know it happens. We sort of care about Henri Bergson, but nowhere close to what he was in his day, right? Um, so right. Yeah. France is, that happens so often in France too, in particular, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> for whatever reason. Yeah. I mean, it's fast paced and they write so much. I mean, just can't keep up. Maybe that's why. Um, mm-hmm. But speaking of figures, of course, before we get into the philosophy of Val and a bit more on his life, I have to ask you the Hermetics question. You can place three yeah. thinkers living or dead into a room and listen in on the conversation. Uh, Jean Val is already sat there waiting for the three to enter. Uh, who do you pick? Mm. I imagine this conversation happening in a classic um, philosophical way. Jean Val is sitting in his um, prison cell after being arrested at Sante prison in Paris, which is still a, uh, uh, still an active prison, but that's the first place he went after his arrest by the Gestapo. Mm-hmm. And uh, talk, talk about existential uh, moment, but but he, uh, I imagine him there and these figures showing up in his cell, kind of like mm-hmm. Boethius with Lady Philosophy showing up, showing up in his uh, prison cell. Um, but I, I have three figures in mind and I, I went around and around thinking about this. And the first figure I picked was Heraclitus. It's a pre-Socratic philosopher, active around 500 BC or so. And uh, each one of these people I name is going to be, there's going to be a reason why obviously they're there. I think they will help us understand Jean Val in through the course of our conversation. But, but Heraclitus is famous uh, for a lot of reasons, but um, he was called the obscure or the Riddler. It's sort of the title that later philosophers gave him. They gave him a sort of superhero title, but he was uh, from, the royal family in Ephesus, which meant that he was a uh, sort of an important um, figure. And uh, but some of the things that he proposed, some of the ideas he proposed, one of the things that I, th- I would love to see him talk about with Jean Val was the fact that he perceived that um, when he looks out at the world, he sees contradictions and oppositions as sort of a fundamental aspect of existence of experience of the world structure itself so you only know what waking is by its opposite by reference to his opposite plato <laughs> makes much of this uh, but 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 he saw that as some as a uh, or you only know what night darkness is by reference to light if you didn't have the other you wouldn't know what the one is so everything is known by reference to what it's not mm-hmm. and um he extrapolated that out as, as a sort of metaphysical it's the, the core metaphysical feature of the of the cosmos is that of this this tension of opposites, and part of Jean Val's philosophy, which he calls dialectic, get into that term. It's a it's a very important term in the tradition from from Plato at least, is to be able is to 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 perceive that structure of of opposition and how opposites are actually required in order for one to be known and to, to exist. The other is also required, but dialectic means perceiving that connection mm-hmm. and, and being able to um, 
see through that opposition to what's beyond it. So, so Vol in all of his thinking and writing is always wanting to, to use a later term, deconstruct ideas and show how they're, they're structured implicitly by reference to what they're not Mm -hmm. in order to show their limitations, but also get a sense or a glimpse to the side of your corner of your eye, what's beyond. And that's really for, for Vol, what the philosophical, uh, what the philosopher can do. Mm -hmm. And that's there already at the beginning with Heraclitus. Mm -hmm. One one thing before you go on, I'm, I'm never, I, I, you know, you almost deserve an award, I think, for introducing Heraclitus without mentioning the river. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, can never step into the same river twice. Everything flows. Everything's in movement. Yeah, yeah. He perceived he perceived change as the fun, as the only unchanging thing in the universe is change. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And uh, and how do you how do you comprehend what's consistent there? If uh, and it's this that structure. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. What's interesting as a second step to me about Heraclitus is that as, and I'm following Richard Seaford. I don't know if you've ever spoken with him or, or read his work. He's an English uh, um, uh, historian of philosophy, um, but he's famous for making this claims about money and mm-hmm. how abstract the abstract, the way the invention of money in the middle of the first millennium BC or so, or, or whenever uh, created this capacity for abstraction that gives birth to philosophy. Anyway, so it's an interesting thesis, it's, and it, it's really uh, he's 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 got a really fantastic book that I'm, I'm thinking about here. But he makes an argument in this book that Heraclitus, and this is where I think the challenge to Jean Ball comes, mm-hmm. and you're going to see this challenge in my second figure too that I wanted to name. But the challenge is what Rick Seaford sees in Heraclitus is that what he calls, and he sees this in a lot of pre-Socratics and post-Socratic, like Plato in particular, is what happens in their thought is not, um, what's the right word, disaffiliated with. It's not without the religious milieu of their day. Mm -hmm. So that philosophy is born as what he calls an interiorization of mystery cult. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That Heraclitus, as a member of the royal family in Ephesus, had a role as a priest in the mystery cult uh, in his hometown. Uh, and what he does in his writings is um, he wants to detach the knowledge that the, mis- the, the, mis- uh, the mystery cults of their day in, in antiquity were all about entering into a relation with a God beyond death, mm-hmm. gaining knowledge about how to navigate life beyond death in order to ensure for oneself a better outcome. Mm-hmm. So it's, it's a, so, so the, uh, just like mystery cults transform our understanding of, of ultimates like life and death. Um, so what, what um, the pre-Socratic earliest philosophers in the West were doing, according to Seifert was abstracting that um, awakening to a deeper knowledge by interiorizing that and making it something to the side of ritual mystery, mystery activity, being able to, to communicate that core, it's almost like a gnosis, mm-hmm. communicate that core knowledge to uh, to their hearers. And that's why he's Riddler, the obscure. He's, he's doing something like the religious mysteries. Um, he's sort of pulling, it, you can see analogous things. Seifert makes much of this in India with the, the earliest um, um, Vedantic thinkers, um, with the Upanishads and things, they're detaching the knowledge from the ritual context mm-hmm. and sort of and sort of making so they can see through that to the highest. Level. Anyway, I think that the more recent historical understandings of what philosophy is about could become very interesting in terms of a conversation conversation with a Jean Val, who's very much a man of his day, and he understands philosophy. Um, in a certain distinction from the religious context, it's just born out of uh, the way in which they thought about what these earliest philosophers were doing and about the character of philosophy as a whole, as a consequence. Mm. I think all of that would be a very fascinating conversation there in his, uh, uh, in his cell in prison with Heraclitus. The second figure, if I can introduce the second figure, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. it's about a thousand years later. So it's about 500 AD. Mm-hmm. 
And it, these are all figures to me that I just uh, adore and, and love, Heraclitus included, John Ball included. But uh, Pseudo Dionysius the Areopagite. Oh, who, interesting. Yeah, is a figure who writes under the pen name of a character in the book of Acts, who's a convert to Christianity um, in Athens when he hears St. Paul's um, speech. Mm hmm. And uh, this guy it takes the name of, of Dionysius the Areopagite. It's very clear that the author is actually probably from the 6th century, probably a Syrian uh, monk, in, in mm -hmm. fact. This is what the scholars tell us. Pseudo-Dionysius is a thinker who's deeply influenced by um, Neoplatonic philosophy. Jean Vol himself, one of his earliest uh, one of his earlier books was on as a sort of a not a commentary exclusively, but a companion to uh, Plato's dialogue, uh, Parmenides, the Parmenides. Mm -hmm. That book uh, is deeply informed by Neoplatonic interpretations of of the text. Mm -hmm. So so mm -hmm. later, you know, around the time. Uh, late, ant late antique, late antiquity any interpretations. Of yeah, any specific Neoplatonists? Are we talking sort of like uh, you know the the, the original Neoplatonism of Porphyry and uh, Plotinus, or are we talking Ficino Renaissance? Yeah, with Pseudo Dionysius, we're talking about. Uh, yeah, of course. And with Pseudo and with what what Jean Ball does actually is 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 with well Pseudo Dionysius is deeply informed. He's almost cut and paste in a lot of ways mm. from Proclus. Mm. who was one of the um, heads of the Platonic Academy, deeply informed by the Yamblikian uh, interpretation. Uh, I know we're just, we're just throwing a lot at, the, <laughs> at, your, at your audience here, but it's, it's so fun. Why not? Mm. Uh, the, a specific interpretation of the great master, the great interpreter of Plato, Plotinus, mm -hmm. a, a specific interpretation that is at odds with other interpretations at the time. Mm -hmm. The, but Dionysius the Areopagite is deeply informed by a certain what's called a theurgic mm -hmm. Platonism, Neoplatonism, mm -hmm. which is deeply intertwined with religion. Mm -hmm. with, and it, and it's, it's all about responding to the rise of a new conception of the divine, a new practice of religion, and sort of trying to Christianity and trying to salvage, to, to, to confront that phenomenon with, uh, with, a, with a recovered, sophisticated conception of pagan intellectual labor that that can compete with it sort of rethinking the transcendence of the divine and so on all of that i would find deeply interesting mm -hmm. as a conversation partner not only with heraclitus who we've seen as, as philosopher but also a religious figure really i mean these guys are like guru, they're more like a guru than they are a you know, uh, like me sitting in my I think, chair. I think it's one of the biggest mistakes we make about a lot of these early philosophers. I mean, the idea of Pythagoras, like one great instance of this, yeah. Pyth Pyth Pythagoras. Oh, he's just a mathematician. It's like in his day, yeah. he would have. That would probably be the last thing we would consider him if we were to meet Pyth Pythagoras. Right? I'm going to go learn some maths, and he's saying, right, that side of the classroom's got to be silent. Only this side can ask <laughs> questions. You've got to eat this special diet. You need to learn yeah. about, like, you need to learn about divine geometry. We, right. Yeah, I think to, as you said, to 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 re-center these figures in relation to the fact that they would have been priests or had this relationship mm -hmm. is, it's not only important. I mean, it's like of importance. If you sort of, like, yes. you can't leave that out. You can't just subsume right. them into just being a philosopher. Okay, so number three, who's who's walking in finally? <laughs> My third figure, and I had a hard time settling on somebody and I had all these great ideas, but the third figure was someone he knew personally. Mm -hmm. His name was Jules Machinon. That was his French name. His uh, Indian Swami name was, <laughs> was Parama Ruby Ananda. He was a, uh, he was a, a Catholic priest who f feels this urge to go to India and he uh, builds an ashram with others, uh, some very famous figures, in fact, um, Henry Lasso, Dombey Griffith, Griffiths, who you may, may, some of your audience may have heard of, but they go and they, they build an ashram dedicated to the Holy Trinity. Mm -hmm. And so what they wanted to do, just like, for example, you could say St. Augustine or some other Christian figure, church father figures, look to Greek philosophy 
and try to and try to absorb its wisdom and its wonder. Mm-hmm. They wanted to do the same thing outside of the, the Western milieu. They mm-hmm. want to do the same thing in India. This great, me- wonderful, rich, spiritual, intellectual tradition with all kinds of you know mountain ranges of of wisdom. They wanted to to to, to learn what they could mm-hmm. um, from that um, truth. So that so they took on the dress of uh, sages in India, and they they practiced prayer in the ways that they do, and they studied their texts. And he wrote a lot of things that are pu- some some are published, some are not. But anyway, uh, Jules Machinon is is a new new Jean Val quite well actually in Lyon mm-hmm. when Val was there before he moved to to Paris as a professor at the Sorbonne. And in fact, you can find uh, a poem that Jean Val wrote. At, um, honoring Jules Manchinon at his death in 1957. I had, I had that, I have it somewhere, but it's, uh, anyway, that figure, I, I think that that's Jules Manchinon was someone whose interpretation of Western philosophical mysticism, mm. the Neoplatonic stream of the West mm-hmm. was deeply informed by Jean Vol. And uh, in fact, and so I'm at, something like you could, I could, it's a good article you know and a scholar could write there with the way in which Jules Machinon takes what he learned from Vol about Platonism and takes it to India and creates an, an intellectual spiritual encounter between the two traditions mm. so that's my third figure that I would love to, to listen to not only with Jean Vol but also pseudo Dionysius and, and Heraclitus those those four would be truly exciting mm. to to listen to so this is a room really about four people who are all dealing with the problem which Val deals with explicitly after many, many thousands of years of sort of refinement. But ultimately, they're all dealing with, uh, if we were to throw it all into a pot, you're dealing with the problem of the divine, the yep. problem of transcendence, the problem yeah, yeah. of yeah. knowledge. And then from that, you have sub- subjectivity and objectivity and what happens when the above and the below mix and how you know does one change and does what happens to one of them when it comes into the other one and does it then if it is explained become something altogether of course they're all be dealing with this in different ways but that seems to be the thread of it's it's almost like a gnostic thread to be honest yeah 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 and remember gnostic is a is a word uh, not to get too theological uh, <laughs> uh, about everything, but but it's fun. Uh, is a word that is uh, has a um, it's a word that you find in the letters of Saint Paul as much as you find in the letters of I mean in, in the writings of the so-called Gnostics of, mm-hmm. of of antiquity that are sort of a in, in conflict with early Christian thought as it's come to be developed. So not gnosis is a is an important word. Uh, and what we what became orthodoxy as much as what became heterodoxy, mm-hmm. and it's it's a fundamental word in uh, Indian uh, philosophy, jnana, jnana, however you say that, and also uh, uh, in Western philosophy in Vol. And I was just looking with my students today. Um, we were looking at Plato's Euthyphro, mm-hmm. an early dialogue of uh, Socratic dialogue, and the whole question about the question of the dialogue is what is piety? Mm-hmm. What is it? What is Eusebia? Cause that's something that just holds together uh, human relationships, but also human divine relationships and our, and our, and, and it's what for the ancient Greeks is what makes our world uh, function. Well, mm-hmm. if humans properly reverence the gods and they can live well, well, Socrates comes along and sort of throws a wrench in the whole machine because he's not satisfied with the way that, question has been answered what piety is Mm -hmm. and he centers it on knowledge Mm -hmm. knowing what the in the dialogue the debate is about knowing what the gods like or don't like but uh um it for for socrates the figure of socrates represents this sort of revolution that happens in in antiquity called philosophy that refigures fundamentally how the ancients thought about the divine and it centers on knowledge and what's our access? The divine has knowledge. Humans are ignorant. But how do we get access to that? We're mortal as opposed to the immortals. This is just speaking for the ancient Greeks. And one of the things about Socrates is that he knows he doesn't know. And that's the starting point and all that. So, uh, but anyway, it, 
the question does center on um, a, a knowledge there in philosophy too. So I think you said it so well when you're talking all these things, as you put it, all these figures from such diverse places and times, they're asking and attempting to answer the same questions. These are sort of permanent. This is why philosophy is live because mm. they're asking and attempting to respond to the same darn questions, you know, uh, that, that, that wherever humans are, these questions are, what does it mean to know? Do we know what's beyond and above what, what, and, and, the philosophical tradition has crystallized around a, f- a few key concepts, including including gnosis, but also transcendence and a, a whole cluster of other things, subject, object, and all that. All that's involved. But Vol is someone, I say all that just to, to as a preparation for our examination of Vol, because he is someone for whom the entire Western tradition is at his fingertips. How so? He, he, How so? I mean, he, what how, is, is Vol in this 19... 19- 37 December 4th 1937 this watershed moment is he coming in with a hammer or how is he approaching this problem why is this such a destabilization uh-huh. of everything you know why is it why is everything at his fingertips and what does he do with it i guess is the question yeah yeah uh ball is extremely well read in the history of philosophy you don't see that on every page mm. but if you look at his magnum opus which is called traite de metaphysique it's like 700 pages. It is an incredible, incredible book. It is a tour de force in the history of Western philosophy. It is a, and, and um, other things, he, he writes a book on Plato. He writes a book on, uh, you know, uh, contemporary existentialism. The guy really, he, he was, he writes a book on English language philosophy, <laughs> pluralism and, and, and William James and some English thinkers as a response to monism of that time. He, 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 you know, he writes important books on Hegel. Then he turns around and writes an important book on Kierkegaard. Mm-hmm. He's he's the first guy lecturing on Nietzsche at the Sorbonne. The guy is really a sophisticated uh, thinker. With that sort of grip mm-hmm. on the whole on the tradition and its and its and a lot of its breadth and all of its diversity and, and depth, he's able to bring that awareness, I suppose, to bear on this or that, uh, the way in which this or that, the questions have been, have cri- been crystallized in his moment. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, and so that's why he's someone to uh, list. That's why he's a respected person to listen to among his contemporaries. Mm. Uh, you know, of course we, we referred to Levinas, but Marcel close friend of his, um, uh, and all the others that are involved there, the Vol is someone who who has their ear. They, they when he speaks, they're going to listen because um, mm-hmm. uh, they they do anticipate that he's going to have something insightful to say. And this was something uh, sort of a something that came through in the text and the other bits I read and about Vol. I mean, just to bring in a metaphor from another French philosopher here, Michel Serre talks about if you mm. were to map out time on a napkin and put all these different points in time we could put heraclitus pseudonionysius uh you know we could put all these people on a napkin and if we folded it up they would all be in the same point because ultimately that's the same transcendental mm. or imminent point and vol seems to almost in a meta way understand that he's stood he's not just another point that's going to be folded in he's marching to that point itself and saying look mm. we need we need to unravel the question of these questions because we've all been we've all been dealing with the same thing yeah, exactly. And he, he's someone who wants to, when he does pair like, you know, an ancient philosopher with a contemporary philosopher, he, he's able to see, you know, you can, me- you can weigh things and measure things in a way that when you have that kind of range, you can, you can see the limitations um, and the way in which the answers are always fragmentary for Vol. He's not a philosopher of the system. He's a philosopher of the fragment. Mm-hmm. And um, when you see that, when you see, you look at, uh, you know, the way Hegel answers things and you set him set just, well, his, his great critic Kierkegaard beside that, you can see some limitations to Hegel. There's something that Kierkegaard says that the human being who asks these questions that both Hegel and Kierkegaard are asking, what does it mean to know? What is the divine? What are we, how do the, how do we, how do we navigate an experience that's full of suffering and so on. These are these are all present in any philosophy that's of any value. Uh, for Vol, he, 
Hegel's got these radical limits that Kierkegaard's going to expose. Mm. And uh, that's one of the things he's always doing. Whatever he's looking at, he wants to find the the contradictions, mm. the limitations, and how each idea has to be sort of, uh, the, the, you got to pull the floor out from under it in order for it to actually do the activity that it has to do, which is point beyond itself to what's, to the more. But there's a problem, I guess, that we, if we were to just crack open Val's you know, sort of actual philosophy with a pretty heavy question for you there. I mean, you've spoken about mm. the idea that he's he's asking questions to get beyond the questions we're asking. I mean, it's the question of how do we get beyond the question of transcendence? Or he's asking about getting be, getting beyond be, the beyond. Yeah. Well, he he no. wants to he wa- he wants to well. What what I what I think he wants to do, he wants to persist in the paradox that he uncovers. He wants to persist at the aporia, the roadblock. He said, that's the human place. Uh, Hegel claims this sort of absolute coincidence of uh, knowledge with itself, that that, that it is embodied in the human awakening to understanding itself as as sort of this divine coming to awareness through it. You know, Mm -hmm. that's sort of the sort of story behind Hegel, that he's the myth, behind the, the logic, the, not the logic, well, the logic itself, but also the, the logos of Hegel. Um, Val doesn't want to, he's always talking about eclipsing transcendence mm-hmm. in order to return to eminence mm-hmm. with a, with eyes that are sort of awakened in wonder at, at, at how perplexing everything is and how, and that's a wonder filled. So he wants to recover in a way, he never says this to my, I've never seen this, and what I've read, but he wants to recover that sort of primitive, not primitive in a negative sense, that original moment of, of awakening to wonder that is the sort of found mm-hmm. the beginning of philosophy as the ancients say. And, and it, it's all about tarrying there. Mm. That's the human place. That's where you find what the ancients called euda, eudaimonia or happiness. Mm. So he's really in a way kind of, he's, he's trying to capture, recover the sort of, what philosophy has always been. And, mm. and he doesn't want to ever, he wants to uncover the questions, but never propose definitive answers. Mm. That's Vol's place. You can raise questions about that, but he, he thinks that is what philosophy is. So, I mean, just to draw, to go back to, uh, you know, our, our river man, Heraclitus, the Riddler, you know, would Vol see it that some people, they walk through the river, they step in the river, and then they get on the other bank and they, they're like, right, I need to make a system to work out what just happened. Where Val, <laughs> Val might step into it and then just like lay down. Go yeah, he with, probably wants you to it. yeah, just go, just just lay down and float down the river and 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 enjoy that. I mean, that's that's the human, the human, the human. The best place to be for the human being is to be perplexed and and seeking to know. It's really captures the spirit of what Plato found in Socrates to be so enchanting. Mm-hmm. So for for Val, would transcendence always transcend itself in relation to our knowledge? Yes, there's always what you could call sorry to use kind of a big phrase, but an apophatic gap between what we know and the thing itself. Mm-hmm. The thing that we seek to know is always greater than our capacity to grasp it. Mm-hmm. That's why we're our, there's the system is all, is impossible. Mm-hmm. A definitive system is always impossible. It's always about the fragmentary the incomplete, um, the, the partial. Mm-hmm. Um, and you know you're doing well when the questions that you're asking deepen and ripen and become uh, sort of, uh, I guess the right word is wonderful. That's Vol's, I think, I think that's, if I, I'm trying to articulate the sort of spirit of Vol's thought, I think that's, and himself as a philosopher, I think we're getting close to that. So the question itself doesn't remain this sort of systematic panic to try and find, like, I can't find the answer and you ignore everything because your your teleology is, well, you have this teleology and it's almost like in chains, but the question itself becomes the philosophy. <laughs> I don't know. So, okay, it's yeah. difficult to, it's quite intuitive. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he does. He says he, he wants to return to, he, sa- he thinks what you do with reason mm. Reason is always responding to something outside of itself. Mm-hmm. And it's always terminating in its activity of trying to understand what he calls the dialectic. 
and reaching this point of aporia and perplexity and confusion, what is, it, it terminates with something beyond itself. And that is not something for Vol that's necessarily, uh, that's, a, that's a multiple endpoint. You know, mm. it's right to end towards pointing towards the divine in some sometimes. It's right to have a more chthonic or, or, or affective sort of termination to our questions. He often talks about feeling. The feeling of transcendence precedes, which the poets capture, precedes and, and sets the seeds for an intellectual uh, conception of transcendence. Mm. He always wants to return to that feeling um, uh, enriched by reason. That's sort of the task of reason. So he wants to, when he talks about returning to imminence, he wants to return to this sort of childlike sense of fullness uh, 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 that the world offers. Mm. He strikes me as someone who was maybe like an agnostic one week a month or something, or was he just, was he completely atheist or, you know, what was No, it? he, yeah, he is a very interesting figure in this regard. <laughs> he, he really, really is. He's, he's a sort of sec- secular Jew, not like sort of more or less a non-practicing Jew. Um, he, well, during his prison term, he was in, he was enchanted by the figure of the suffering Christ some the god the powerless god he called it a lot of the poetry he wrote in prison and in the camp which followed prison for him and then he escaped eventually mm-hmm. um a lot of the poetry he wrote was about uh this figure of christ who uh this sort of the the, the infinitely powerless god he, he god who is beside him and suffering with him he uh he married a catholic there kids were raised uh catholic he never uh he there's some really great poems and comments that he has uh, even later ones and when he's old in which he says things like the task of the philosopher is not to provide definitive answers to the problem of uh the mystics or the problem of transcendence i i so he'll say things like, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a, I'm a, what did he call himself? A non-unified Jew. Um, he call, he thinks of himself as both Greek and Jew. He thinks of himself as open to what Christianity has to say, but also someone who remains at, at the sort of in limbo, as it were. Mm-hmm. He, he, that was sort of his vocation in a sense that he felt was his own. He at one point in later writings, he even he says something. What is required is a um, an agnostic mysticism, and so so you know, I think one of his hero Kierkegaard would would want to critique that. Mm-hmm. You're gonna, you, you're mortal. You're going to run out of time. Mm-hmm. It's all about deciding. You know that kind of, that kind of response would be something that Kierkegaard might might say to him. But for him, it was the most authentic way to live, is and the closest you the close the way to be the close closest to God, is to be aware of the um, the limitations of our our human perspective mm-hmm. and the transcendence of the divine beyond our sort of capturing. So, what might Val say about a leap of faith? In that Kierkegaardian sense, would he say, "You once you've done that, well, then you've got to keep you've got to keep leaping." Yeah, 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 yeah. He might he might say that. Um, you know, he's really close friends with uh, Emmanuel Levinas, mm. sort of a devout Jewish figure. He's all very close friends with Gabriel Marcel, who's who's a Christian, uh, a devout Christian figure. Um, Val is was always is always very open to what religion has to say. But he, there's something about his self understanding, in which it's not his place to to determine that for some reason. It just, that's just where he ends up. And I, that's as far as I can kind of get into his psyche mm-hmm. there, or his perspective. But, but it's something about what he calls the philosopher's way. That was his first book in English called The Philosopher's Way. It's, um, the philosopher's way is to tarry in the perplexity. And that's, uh, he thinks that's the best way to honor divine transcendence even. And I honor the mystery of, of existence too. So, but so the leap of faith for him, he, he does ask questions like, well, is there a way to, he didn't say it in these terms, but is there a way to secularize Kierkegaard? 
to take what he has to say. It's that that's not. Can you be a Kierkegaardian and not be a Christian? Mm. You know, that's one of the questions that he asks there in 1937, which sparked a lot of debate. I was about to ask. I mean, this this philosophy, which is fragmented and actually seemingly oddly simple in a way. Yeah. Um, why was this such a watershed moment as you describe it um, in 1937? I mean, you know, it was only a, it was only was it a long lecture in 37 or was it just a single lecture and everyone went okay, something's changed. I mean, what did it really yeah. change for these people who then took it? Well, you know, we're at the cusp of, of we're in 37. So it's a very really um, intense time, and things get really intense um, in Paris. Shortly thereafter, um, you have the beginning. The, the, one of the fundamental, most important movements of in French philosophy after the war is existentialism. Mm-hmm. Bef- this is right there before the war, and they're asking the questions. Uh, they're 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 Kierkegaard is sort of rediscovered. He's one of the main guys who, through whom this Kierkegaard uh, comes. He's setting the stage for, you could put it this way, for existential, for the philosophy of existentialism after the war. And he's there in the midst of all that, asking those questions. What is, what is existentialism? Um, what, is the, what does existence mean? Um, what is this? What is this sort of profound trend or movement in philosophy that we're kind of all sharing in? And so they're all getting a sense of that around this time. That's why it's an important. So he's asking those questions we talked about, Mm -hmm. about Kierkegaard, his significance. Do you have to be, do you have to think of uh, divine transcendence and faith uh, to be a true existentialist? Or can you be uh, someone who doesn't have, who doesn't possess that? So that's one thing. That's one thing. Um, So it's the existential question. The other major philosophy that, bursts on the scene in, in, the, in the late 1920s in Germany, 1927, uh, and then gets bursts on the scene in Paris is Heidegger. Mm-hmm. And Vall is there at the beginning too. He's reading Heidegger with his students in the late 1920s. Wow. He, he's very early. Even when he's uh, he loses his job because he's Jewish, during the, for the Vichy statutes against the Jews, he, he's a as a professor at the Sorbonne. You're an employee of the state. He loses his post. Uh, he's he meets with his students for many many months, in kind of in an underground classroom. And he says, "If the Germans come, just tell them we're reading Heidegger. Maybe that'll <laughs> help." Because he knew that Heidegger was such a darling of the Nazi Party before, and he said it couldn't hurt to tell them that we're reading a German philosopher who who, who was a uh, significant significant to at least at one at one time to to the regime in germany so so the, the so the debate between that's in the it's in the book uh heidegger writes a letter levinas writes a letter that's present in response to so so Vall sent his lecture to people who weren't there and like in in carl jaspers is another one who wasn't there and there's many others big big names everybody who's anybody is is almost is there Mm. Um, and if they're not there, they're writing letters. They're incorporated into the the acts of the uh, of the uh, the French Society of Philosophy that, that they were participating in. So, so the debate between Levinas's letter, Heidegger's letter, which is a response to what Vall says about Heidegger, Levinas is also responding to what Vall says about Heidegger. They both are. Um, there's a debate about what Heidegger means, and it's happening right there. That becomes important, even still to this day, for French phenomenology. The debates they were having then set the stage for interpretations of Heidegger subsequently. So anyway, that's that's just another thing to flag about this event's import, importance in 1937. It's also important for, depending on how, how important this or that person thinks Levinas is, it's a it's a it's an important. It's the first place where um, Levinas uses. The concept of the other, which becomes so important in Levinas's philosophy later, totality and infinity and, and so on. Uh, it, it just had a big influence on Levinas, this event. He's the one who called it simply Vol's famous lecture. That's what that's how he referred to it. So anyway, I, I named Heidegger Levinas and then you know the existential readings of Kierkegaard, what, what all those meant. All that was sort of 
I guess the foundation, the bricks of the foundation are being laid for all these different scoop for these different uh, for philosophy subsequently. That's why it's important. Mm. I guess what's interesting there is that this, as you say, it's 37. We, we, you've had World War One, of course, but it's yeah. it's almost like Val is refusing to solidify anything. So, for instance, if you take the Dadaists, the art, the art movement of Dada, their mm-hmm. art movement sort of solidified itself in the wake of the absurdity of World War One, right? This complete machinic, machinized hells, and then the, the art itself yes. becomes Dada. Um, but it's almost like Val is responding to something which hasn't yet been. So he's sort of saying, look, why do we even need, we, we're already approaching this strange anxiety with regard to these questions. We don't need the systematic solidification of it. Keep, let's keep the question rolling instead of having another, you know, striated movement, which then breaks and then again and again. Do you, mm-hmm. would you think yeah. there's something in that? Yes. And he deeply resisted, like a lot of them did, Heidegger, all of everybody. The question, no one wanted to be labeled existentialist. Jaspers didn't, you know, and Marcel. These are all the guys that are, as you look back, these are the central existentialists. I mean, here we are. Uh, Evolve too. They they never wanted to things to, to sort of concretize and solidify mm. and not be, and to become something less than that sort of original vibrancy that, uh, that they, that they feel is like the, the sort of core impulse of philosophy. Mm. That is very much captures something about Val. Do you think the reason maybe a little reason Val is somewhat overlooked is because he's one of the few that since now, now we can look back on history. He's one of the few that didn't sort of solidify and actually <laughs> the rest in their own way. Heidegger, Heidegger is fairly systematic in being in time, for instance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Heidegger, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, Heidegger proposes a really developed, at least to his mind, there's a stream, there's a consistent stream of development of thought in Heidegger's uh, philosophy, mm-hmm. even though you have to, you know, this great change, you know, apparently Heidegger one, Heidegger two, all those other guys talk about, but in Heidegger's mind, there's a there's a there's a, just a consistent deepening of a single question, mm. and his philosophy. This question is the most important question. It's the question of being, uh, and its difference from beings. You know, and and this is the this is the this is the question of all questions. The book and and he reads everything through that lens. Mm. So he looks at this or that philosopher, how they measure up to the way that he thinks about this question and what the answers are. And he judges them according to that and how, how well they've clarified and expressed this fundamental question. So he, Vol is, is different. He's, he's a different personality. You know, I think part of it may have, still have a lot to do with personality. Uh, he does propose a philosophy. And as you put it, it's, it's quite simple. And the best, the best ideas are the simplest ones. I mean, think of Heidegger, for example, again, the idea is being and its difference from beings. I mean, that is the, that is the, what, what he wants to see mm-hmm. full stop. That's it. Um, now, now being is characterized in a certain way. It's, it's structured by finitude and it's temporal. It's coming out of nothing and going back. And this is all, this is all the twist he puts on the question. Uh, but, but the, the simplicity of a philosophical vision, like Heidegger, Heidegger did say, every philosopher asks one question. And that's how you have to understand them. But anyway, all that's to say is, is that for Vol, yeah, he doesn't, his approach is, is, is not like Heidegger. It's not like Hegel. It's not really, it's not like Kierkegaard, which has such a strong religious impulse to it. His is his own and um, its value is not found in whether or not it's taught as a major philosophical system in in the academy or in, you know in philosophy classes, its its value to me is is the way in which it awakens something human in us, mm. and it doesn't let us it doesn't allow us to um, to move away from the peculiar obscurity of that original impulse. That's, that's it's sort of like that's his one thing. Mm. So if we were, if we, I mean, we sort of touched on it, but if we were to go off that Heideggerian position that every philosopher asks one question, what yeah. question, what question is Val asking? It's sort of a meta question, right? 
Yeah. Well, uh, my first response to that is the question of transcendence. Mm. But I think even the deeper question to what is transcendence, transcendence is an interesting question because his question is, what, what am I? Mm. What, what does it mean to be human? And it's tied in with this idea, this, this feeling, this sense that becomes concrete and clarified. Then we can look at it and examine with this concept of transcendence, but he doesn't want to stop there. He wants it to point us back to this sense of I'm a mystery to myself. I, the, my experience, I'm incomplete. I have this, this, I'm, I'm an enigma. Mm. What it means to be human is an enigma, and he and he wants to. That's his question. I see. So the question's tough because in asking the question, "What am I?" or "Who am I?" if you want to put it that way, sure. in relation to what he calls negative ontology, right? That well, as soon as you're asking that question, you are no longer asking it because you have to you have to put it in relation to the negative. So it's like, "What am I?" Okay, well, what isn't me? And that's the transcendent, and then it starts <laughs> pinging back and forward. And yeah. but this doesn't seem one thing I would throw in 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 relation to like you know transcendence and the person in in this in the dialectical sense is yep. that um this doesn't ex- doesn't seem to exactly map onto the ideas of interior exterior so it's mm-hmm. not a question of almost like the chaldean oracles know thyself there's something more going on here in that question you know having that sort of back and forward dialectical thing it isn't always about the internal and we that that may, would that be a bit precious for val well yeah there yeah I've thought about this because you know, he talks about this agnostic mysticism and, and a lot of the Western tradition, the mystical, and, and I'm talking about philosophy here, mm. the, the philosophical mystic, like the Neoplatonic impulse is one of a turn. There's an interior turn, mm. you know, it's, it's, you, there's an ecstasy, not an ecstasy. There's a, there's a these sort of, you, you're, to transcend, you have to, you have to enter into the spiritual dimension. You have to mm. sort of turn from the world and, and enter into this sort of, you know, uh, uh, interior terrain that you're trying to navigate and then train and ascend. Uh, Vol, Vol doesn't have that. I don't think it's absent from Vol, but for Vol, the interior is of less interest than um, the ecstatic, not the instatic, the ecstatic. That is the sort of impulse to, to move beyond oneself out into the world. And he gets that. I think he he gets that from uh, phenomenology. So so from the school of phenomena. Heidegger is in the school. Husserl is the great origin of phenomenology in the year nineteen hundred or so. Uh, Heidegger is his student. Phenomenology comes comes on, uh, through Heidegger into France. And what one thing that Heidegger said is that uh, modern philosophy has reached a sort of impasse. In this question of this, this for Heidegger, the stupid question of how can what how can what's interior to me have any con- real contact with what's outside? Mm. Like that's the you know the kind of modern epistemological question. The question of modern the modern question of knowledge is framed in in how does what's this uh, intellectual or spiritual how does the soul relate through the body to what's outside of it and beyond it. So you have this interior subject and this exterior world. It's the problem of their relationship, you know, this sort of dualistic uh, thing. Heidegger says, take a step back. Phenomenologically speaking, if you just take a look at human experience, what you're going to see is that we're all always already out amidst things. We're always already thrown out into the world and we're already in the midst of stuff. There's that, that question is so is, is a step away from a human experience. So he, he neutralizes the whole problematic of mm. that, that drove modern philosophy from Descartes and, and says, it's a non-starter. Mm. And Vol loves that. He thinks that is, that is exactly right. We're all like to put it in the language of Merleau-Ponty, his contem- contemporary, uh, or, uh, uh, we are, uh, we, uh, we, um, we're always, we're intertwined with the world. The self is already intertwined with the outside. So we're interlaced. Our, the interior is already exterior and the exterior is already interior. And that's the, that's, that's a faithful description of, of what it means of, of our relationship to the world. We're all, we're already out in it. 
and engaged with it. Mm. So, I mean, that's really interesting. There's a there's a fantastic book by uh, Ed Baring, Converts to the Real, on the history of phenomenology, uh, hmm. sort of focusing on the fact that sort of what's been canonized with Heidegger is generally you have Husserl, the master. Uh, the frustrating master, we should say, when we come to read him, uh, and then one way, <laughs> one way, one way, you have Heidegger, which is really is sometimes now Husserl is degraded, demoted to a, f- a footnote to Heidegger. Sometimes you know, oh, that's mm, sure, that's what, yeah. And this is emphatically atheistic at times, right? God is subsumed. I think, I think, in terms of atheism, Heidegger is almost better than Nietzsche, and in, in uh, almost, you know developing what's going on there on I the would other love to hear you say that <laughs> on, on the other side of things you have the the the, the overlooked thinkers in a way um that were sort of i guess not pushed aside and there's reasons things get ignored but most most famously you have someone like edith stein and these people who actually come to phenomenology and from phenomenology instead of going uh, this leads us away from God or God is no longer real or whatever. We have the material mm-hmm. phenomena. This actually leads people closer to God. Now, the peculiar thing is here that Val's trajectory from phenomenology actually seems to be a middle position. Yeah, <laughs> that's an interesting point. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, he, he's trying. He's, one of his tasks is he always wants to keep the sort of pathways open. Um, in a lot of ways, he's like Heidegger. Heidegger's great critique of Christianity or of theology was that it it, it sort of answers the questions of, uh, that shouldn't be answered. Mm. You know, it's always it's always coming too early with with sort of definitive answers to absolute questions. That was his great uh, sort of criticism of of Christian theology, I suppose. Mm. The, um, Vol is like that in a sense. He does want this, what he called an agnostic mysticism. And in a way, that just repeats the Neoplatonic. The, the absolute is unknown. It's unknowable. And the whole Neoplatonic trajectory is, is sort of to, to preserve and to promote a language that, ju- that, that does justice to the transcendent of the, of, of the ultimate divine, the one, as Plotinus called it, sort of the ultimate condition uh, that uh, informs everything but can never be captured. Vol, so he's he's like Heidegger, but he's also more like, I think, uh, Plotinus. Not that he's a Neoplatonist, <laughs> but I think that that urge to, to it, that apophatic urge is runs very strongly in Jean Vol's thought. I mean, in relation to... Placing him, you know, more firmly in the Neoplatonic tradition, do you think he has an, his own version of asceticism, or you know, uh, perhaps not in the in their very, you know, the physical like fasting yeah. and yeah. self-flagellation or anything like that, but but a relationship with the world, which is one which is casting it off. I think the. Well, I was just thinking about his, the the sufferings that marked his life in that year of mm-hmm. trial that he had. Um those were places where that deeply informed his reflections and he was always all of that suffering and all of that, you know, the terrible things that he endured. And he, despite he, one of the things he wrote, he had a canteen mm-hmm. and he, sc- he sc- scratched into this canteen when he was in the camp. Uh, despite yourself, you live. It's, it's, it's from the Talmud. Uh, and he, he scratched it in Hebrew letters despite yourself you live why is he that he's not in control of this experience he, he could be the one who's who's killed tomorrow and all of us are that way it's something it's something that names the human experience it, it describes it faithfully to say despite yourself you're alive no one asked you you're thrown into the world you know you're here at this moment mm. This person's not anymore. Uh, how do you respond to that? Mm-hmm. How do you respond to that? Uh, and his choice in responding to that is to to hope. I, I, um, his suffering marked his. Um, it it didn't um, sort of deflate his philosophy, 
but it invigorated it, you know, so. Do you think that's what's stuck underneath all this questioning for Val and always the, the, the retaining the question and, as you say, making sure our philosophy is always philosophy and imbued with that wonder is that beneath that there is there is just a general sense of there's hope in just that. Let's just keep keep going. Let's just keep philosophizing and keeping it keeping it wondrous. Yeah, that's the task. It's it's easy when you turn when you do so philosophy sort of its own worst enemy <laughs> because it forges, you know, to fl- fl- if there's there's no philosophy, if there's no concept in theory. Mm-hmm. And so that's not the only way that the human being understands. We first understood through story, through narrative, mm-hmm. through myth. And then philosophy emerges as sort of this competitor and with ten- in tension with myth and telling stories and the, the ritual order of contact with the, the sort of power, this, with the rea- absolutes, with the fundamental realities. Philosophy steps to the side and, sa- and, and proposes that it's through concept and theory that you can, you can live the human way. Um, and Vol's very, that's very important to Vol. It's also its own enemy because you can, it can work, operate under the illusion that what the things that it says, the, the, the concepts that it forms, the systems that it forms, the thing, uh, the ideas that it have to which refer to ultimate realities, to refer to reality, you can mistake the ideas for the thing itself. Mm. You can lose focus. These, these are, you're meant to transcend those things to the realities. They're supposed to, they're like names. Just to go back to the figure of Pseudo Dionysus, who talks about divine names. Uh, these things are, are ways of naming the real. They're, they're, and they have some contact with it, we hope. And, 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 and if they lend insight into our experience, they do. Uh, but it's easy for us to lose that, what we called a minute ago, that apophatic distance. Mm. It's both an affirmation and also a negation. It both, it, 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 it's, we forge concepts and they emerge and they illumine, but they also have limitations. And Ball wants to hold on to both that tension, that contradiction in the very core of our concepts. In, in the, the, the uh, I don't know, the illusion, he wants to avoid the illusion mm. that those are the real. Do you think that's why poetry holds such an important place for him as well? That it's almost like in that he has a closer touch with the actual experience, with this move away from in yeah. poetry yeah. things become, you know, it's often said. He, he thinks that poetry and metaphysics, as he says in the book, poetry and philosophy or poetry and metaphysics, uh, poetry came before their fellow, uh, their fellows, and philosophy should realize that it's sort of grounded in the poetic vision Mm -hmm. and that uh, it should return to that. That's why he wants to take poets. He got all his his friends riled up when he said that in the, in the lecture about, you know, the poets are are sort of the the first philosophers in a way. Hmm. Um, And uh, he wants, what he meant by that was just simply to say that they have this, they're at the origin of that philosophical wonder and we can learn from them the artists, the poets, we could expand that to say the mystics. Mm-hmm. Well, we've some, we've managed to cover some fairly abstract ground. I mean, is there anything you'd like to add in about Val that you feel, feel is key? I mean, of course we haven't, we've touched mostly on his work on transcendence and, and mm. uh, human existence here. Um, but is there anything you'd like to add in that you feel, feel would be key? I think if I had to add something, I would, it could be worth talking about his, the co- how he thinks about the concept of transcendence, giving its importance mm-hmm. to his <laughs> to his thought. <laughs> oh. Yeah, yeah. Why not? You know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's such a tough question, though. <clears throat> yeah. Um, for him, one of the things that he wants to do with the concept. Mm-hmm. He thinks he thinks that the tradition, as he's received it from before through the Middle Ages, has given a sort of exclusive primacy in the idea of transcendence to the divine, mm-hmm. as you know, the monotheistic divine. Mm. And he thinks, well, trans- what phenomenology does is say that there's a, so there you have this transcendence of height, this transcendence of alter- you know, um, using the image of height of, of distance mm. and of um, 
qualitative magnitude, if you can use that. <laughs> I don't know if that works. The, the above sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. You also, he wants to say, he calls that trans us in this. Mm-hmm. You also have, a, you have other, you have a pluralization of the idea involved. Mm-hmm. You also have a transcendence of depth, which it's worth thinking about. You have uh, tr- what that's what he calls trans descendants. Mm-hmm. For him, that's sort of the affective, the, uh, the, the, the animal dimension that become, has become so important, actually, in contemporary f- uh, French philosophy, as I did the animal. Uh, the animality of of ourselves there's that aspect that's sort of a like my animal body is what creates the conditions for me to to philosophize Mm. also you know how how does that how how does it do that and and so on there's this idea of transcendence the transcendence of intensity the qualitative affective feeling Mm. the 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 that dimension. I get the sense. I get the sense that this isn't like an unconscious. This isn't a psychology thing. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think he he could probably allow that idea of of Freud to to say something valid about it's something that it's something that's beyond our our awareness. So in that sense, it's a transdescendence. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He would he would accept that as some you know that's something worth exp- that's something valuable to this idea. Mm-hmm. Okay. So he's just pluralized it in two directions, so to speak. Mm-hmm. He also, there's a third, what he calls somewhere flat transcendence. You could even call it um, horizontal, you know, not vertical. It goes up and down, but also transcendence that goes horizontal. It's the phenomenological transcendence of Heidegger Mm. for which uh, what transcends us is um, the things that we're, we're striving for the things out in the world. Um, uh, It's sort of like a banal transcendence, phenomenological transcendence. We're always aspiring in Heidegger, our, in the early Heidegger, our pro, we have these projects that we, that's how we, we, we normally interact with the world. They become t- useful tools for the projects that we're trying to accomplish and realize. Mm-hmm. And what looms over all of this for Heidegger, which we are always trying to avoid, is our mortality and finitude. Mm-hmm. That's the, what truly transcends us for Heidegger is nothing. <laughs> being, being unto death, right? Yeah, 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 mm-hmm. yeah. Being towards death, exactly. Towards death, yeah. And that, and you have to, reconcile with that that's that's what that's what it means to be human for Heidegger. Mm-hmm. so you have you have he thinks that's that that kind of flat horizontal transcendence is, is actually that's that's valid that's a that enriches the concept it, it thickens the the idea of transcendence another thing that he he does which is really great because it it it, it uh it, this is where the core of his criticism of Heidegger. It's really great. He says transcendence in all these plural ways that he's just named has a twofold tension within itself. You can find it in each one of those places, mm-hmm. height, depth, and flat transcendence. You have transcendence of what he calls movement, transcending. It's that ecstatic character of the human being. We're always out into the world. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're always in movement beyond ourselves, and that's what we are. That's that kind of paradoxical picture of the human that's co- at the core of uh, Heideggerian phenomenology. You have transcendence of movement. You also, but that's not all it is. You have to be moving to something. And he calls that transcendence of turn or of end or of goal, the thing that it's, that it's striving for. And you can't collapse those two. I mean, there's a criticism of Heidegger because the term is what motivates the movement in the first place, it's like a telos or a purpose. And if you if you take away like Heidegger wants to, all in, in a metaphysical sense, the 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 reality that transcends, mm-hmm. you uh, the movement's going to collapse. Okay, so this is where he this is why he wants to keep the place open for religious transcendence. Um, as he discovered it in Kierkegaard, because uh, he thinks on the one hand, you can't have a, you have to have a clear enough picture of the goal or the uh, ultimate good or um, ultimate beatitude or or the thing that motivates action behind everything. This is in Plato. This is in, you know, in Aristotle. This is in Thomas Aquinas and Augustine. This is the, the tradition's way of thinking about understanding 
uh, human, the activity of human thought and the activity of human practical activity. Behind it all is a, a quest to know the def- definitive truth and to, to be enraptured by the ultimate good. Mm-hmm. Right? But if you, if you condense that term of transcendence that you're striving to, too concretely, you've, it's going to, it's also going to, the movement's going to, you've created in, in religious terms, you created an idol mm-hmm. and, and uh, those, that's not worth pursuing. Yeah. You know? mm-hmm. So uh, he, he wants to keep this tension inherent within you. You have to have a, you have to have a transcendent term, but it can't be, it has to be that apophatic distance can never be collapsed. So in a sense, that's a nod to the way the classical tradition in the West has always thought about uh, divine transcendence. You know, if, if you can, if you can conceive that it is not God, mm-hmm. you know, just to quote uh, St. Augustine for, for one. You know, so anyway, it, 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 and you see how Val is always trying to keep the paths open. Yeah, and that's uh, that's he he manages to do it in a way which isn't sort of like anxiety inducing. Like he's, yeah, quite, he's yeah. quite a relaxed thinker about this. He's not. He doesn't yeah. seem stressed about the fact that he might at some yeah. point fall into something. I don't know, I th- and that comes yeah, through yeah. in his style as well. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, he's a laid back thinker. <laughs> I don't know. It comes, exactly. It comes across that. Yeah. Way. Yeah. I, I love that. And um, if you see the cover of Human Existence and Transcendence, um, there's a picture of Vol on the side of a mountain. And he's just relaxed. He's saying he take, took up his glasses for the picture. His ties, ties really loosened. Um, you can tell he got pretty hot walking up the, the mountain. And he's in the, the really deep foreground of the deep foreground, the, 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 the close foreground of the picture. And behind him, you see the hill he's on. And it's sort of like a foothill. And there's this tiny little trail that kind of goes and you follow the trail with your eye. And then looming above is this huge, it breaks the frame of the picture, is this huge, you know, Swiss mountain. That's where he is uh, in the, Dol- the Dolmites. But he, he um, that's a great picture of him. He's, he's stopping and taking a rest and he's pondering the sort of human journey. Mm. And you can see where things are going but you can't see it definitively. Mm. You just have enough sort of for the next step. And then once you go for a while, you're going to stop and consider things and, 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 and wonder at them. And I love that his daughter, uh, Barbara gave me that photo for the, the cover. And I think it's just a perfect cover. Mm. It really captures a lot of his thought. It's an interesting sort of meta metaphorical exercise as well to ask what would other philosophers do in that metaphorical scene most of them would probably start sprinting down the path right they need they need, <laughs> they need the they need the answer they need to know the mountain yeah. or whatever know what's on the other side i like the, but i like what val is doing is sort of even before he's got there he's, well, we'll just we'll rest now and see what we'll see what happens with transcendence soon yeah he's not anxious uh and that that does lend him a certain uh way of seeing that's that separates him from other philosophers you're right mm. i mean yeah and this question i uh, i guess why, why do you think it is that he has been so overlooked maybe forgotten i think um other figures that he interacted with um and that he influenced and worked with they're just you know they banged the drums the loudest you know Heidegger is just, he's the loudest guy in the room, mm-hmm. you know, when, when he's, when he's talking. So everything else is just idle chatter. What I have to say is the really, the really, the, this is the real mm. deal. You know, you have to, <laughs> have to change his voice and talk like that. You know, this is the significant, uh, you know, Derrida was his, his, the, the sort of the, the, the pyrotechnics of Derrida are so tremendous. Uh, Heidegger's the same, you know, Levinas is, is just so, uh, heavy. I mean, it's just so heavy and, and rich. He's more, he has a lighter touch and he's, um, I think it's one of the reasons that he's overlooked. Um, you know, um, the future will tell. I, th- I think that, uh, and who knows, maybe this is his proper place. That's, that's not the canon as it, so to speak is, is always being written and the past is always recovered in, in interesting ways for the next generation. So at the very least, Vol is someone worth pondering the fundamental questions with. Mm. 
because he can give you a sense of that wonder that he wants to communicate, uh, that poetic wonder at the sort of core of, of philosophical questioning. But also he's going to, you know, sh- pull the rug from out from under you if you need that. <laughs> you know, yeah. you haven't, your ideas are not, are always partial, fragmentary, and they don't see the whole. Where would you advise people to begin with his work? Well, besides my own writings, I, you know, so, but no, I would uh, say um, I think it is. I think uh, you know, I would I would say human existence and transcendence with your, uh, yeah. you know, with the edits. It is. I mean, I imagine it probably would be a, a place that a lot of people would recommend anyway because it is that watershed moment, and it's yeah. not. It's pretty accessible. Even like even what Val's own work is pretty accessible mm. in it. It is. It is. I mean, it's in one. In some ways, it's a challenging text. It's it's sort of unfinished. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of, it's incomplete. That does characterize his philosophy, his approach. It has to but at be, the same right. time, what? It sort of has to be. Unf- like if he, fin- yeah. if he, if he, he said, I've finished it, you'd be like, whoa, I'm a bit suspicious. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. Exactly. There, there's a great collection called Transcendence in the Concrete that came out a few months after Human Existence and Transcendence. It's a collection of his writings. Mm-hmm. Uh, in that collection, if I was going to point to one, that it's called the Selected, Selected Writings of Jean Ball. Uh, and that's not the one. Uh, or is it? Well, there's a um, there's an essay, a chapter. It's a really great chapter. He wrote it later in life. It's full of his poetry and um, has some of his musings on God. And, and the, it's, it's about the ways in which he thinks a lot of the core philosophical ideas need to be rethought um, today. Um, and uh, it's the chapter called Experience and Transcendence, or I love this, An Ontological Journey. It's a great chapter to read from trans- uh, Transcendence in the Concrete, that collection by Schrift and Moore. They did such a great job with that. Mm. So that's a good place to start, too. Okay. okay. Finally, there is in English a very small book of poem, poems tra- of his translated into English. Um, it's very hard to find, but it's poems that he wrote. It's, it's poems that he wrote in the uh, prison and in the camp. And it's, it's, it's a beautiful text. I found a copy online and, and bought one and it's, it's got the, it's signed by the uh, translator and it's made on like homemade paper and it's really cool. There's only like 275 of these things around. But anyway, if you can get access to that, you can get you can get a taste of some of his poetry in English. Mm. Okay. And uh, t- with this, the way that he thinks about poetry and its relationship to philosophy, that's uh, worth looking at mm. in, ter- in terms of trying to understand Paul. Okay. Okay. Yep. Are you uh, are you still now doing work on Val, or are you working on something else? Oh, yeah. I, um, you know, since I've, I've taken a big na- uh, narrative turn in my work. Mm-hmm. Um, a few years ago, I started writing this novel on Wall. It was published, uh, well, I guess last year, uh, into 2021. I've written the prequel to that novel. And also I'm three quarters of the way through the sequel. It'll ultimately have four parts. And it tells the story uh, of that year. Um, Ball was arrested. On July 31st, 1941, he goes through this journey of, of, of going to prison, being put in prison, going to the camp outside of Paris, the transit camp, escaping, going into hiding in Paris, fleeing to the set free zone in the south of France, where the Germans were not yet, uh, leaving France altogether. He saw the writing on the wall. The Germans are going to take over all of France. They're after him anyway. He was a public enemy. He was supposed to be shot on sight if they caught him. He goes to Casablanca in Morocco and then and then takes a boat from there to the United States, sees the Baltimore skyline a year to the day that he was arrested, hmm. July 31st, 1942. So I've been working on that project. I, philosophically speaking, I wanted it to be faithful to his. I wanted it to be also not, not just a great story, sort of a thriller type escape story, but I also want it to be those four volumes to be faithful to his philosophical attitude and reflections. So there, it, it, it try to capture a lot of that in there. So I, and I won't in, I won't stop with that as far as fiction goes. Um, I've written a, another manuscript and I have some other ideas 
So all in due course, fiction, I think, will be a bigger part of my work. I've in the past done a lot of translation from French to English. Mm -hmm. That's exhausted me. And so I, I, I do have some things that I want to translate, like Stanislas Breton, who was a French philosopher, Catholic philosopher, a uh, really fascinating figure. He, that's someone who it would be great I know, uh, to, for you, you, your audience to explore, Stanislas Breton, really a, just a, like Vol, he's sort of on the margins, mm -hmm. But he is so interesting and profound. Mm -hmm. So interesting. There's a book of his that I'm really tempted to translate and then write a commentary on. Mm -hmm. um, I want to do that possibly. Um, I have, I'm, I'm writing a couple of books, one on Parmenides and one on uh, uh, Boethius that I want to, to do. So anyway, I, got, I'm all over the place. got a lot going on. Yep. Yeah, I love it. It's, uh, it's what uh, a big part of my life is writing for sure. I get that. Well, I teaching mean, and writing. Yeah. Is there anything you'd like to add in before we finish up? I don't think so. I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to, to share with you and your listeners more about Vol. I hope people will check him out. Yeah, I'll uh, be sure to put the links for, uh, you know, the, your work on Vol in the description below. Um, I'm sure the publisher says University of Notre Dame Press for the book we've primarily been talking about. They probably appreciate yeah. buying it from that yeah. website. Uh, but it can all be found. I'll put the links in the description below. But other than that, Chris Hackett. Thanks very much. James, my pleasure.